Hello, and thank you for taking time out of your evening to tune into our SSC webinar series this evening. Uh, I'm Tommy Mooney, a senior SNC coach at the clinic here. Um, alongside my role here at the clinic, uh, I work with a host of different athletes and different ages uh, from a multitude of different sports, including team sports, individual sports, field sports, court sports, uh, track and field ranging in ages from six years old to 80 years young. My presentation today is going to be about how we can protect our young athletes in modern sport. I'm going to suggest a three-pronged model for optimum health and development. Um, first and foremost, we're going to talk, talk about the importance of the multi-sport and using multiple different sports and activities to try and enhance our movement vocabulary. By movement vocabulary, I mean and trying to think of the, the more words you have, the more sentences you can make. So the more movements we learn, the more skills uh, we can accomplish and showcase in our sport. We're gonna talk about training loads and trying to find the optimal balance between rest and training. And then thirdly, we'll talk about strength and condition and um, utilizing things like resistance training to again, enhance, uh, enhance that movement vocabulary, increase our robustness, uh, improve performance, and reduce the risk of injury. Okay, first, I'd like to present a story to you. So we have two kids here, both seven years, eight years old, so old enough to know that they know everything. Jack here on the right-hand side is a tennis player, uh, adamant that he wants to become the next big thing in tennis. His parents are certain that he's gonna become a tennis player and his whole uh, life revolves around playing tennis, training tennis, and getting as good at tennis as possible, okay? Uh, Jill here on the left-hand side plays a multitude of sports, gymnastics, tennis, GAA, and athletics um, outside of her busy social schedule. Um, and she wants to become a gymnast or an influencer when she's older. So my question to you is which person or which child do you think has a longer and more successful sporting career? Now, ultimately, we can't pick one and we never know. There's been many childhood prodigies like Tiger Woods, Lionel Messi, the Williams sisters, who've gone on to uh, emulate their childhood success. Um, but despite that, we often, we would suggest that adopting a multitude of sports and playing many different sports is, is typically the optimum way to try and develop uh, a broad range of skills and capacities that can then lead into uh, your final sport or your, your, your sport at the end of your career or as you age. Other benefits of multiple sports are that children are going to learn multiple different skills. It's going to help uh, prevent burnout and an increase participation for longer, um, reduce the risk of injury, improve cognitive skills and decision making, typically more enjoyable as it offers some breaks in between different sports. Um, and also we know that early sport diversification is linked to a longer sporting career, as we already mentioned. Okay. Forgetting about sport for a minute, we know that children nowadays are typically slower when compared to uh, children 30 years ago. They are weaker when compared. They are less physically literate and less physically active, okay? So um, introducing uh, children who may not be playing sport to physical activities like our strength and conditioning is gonna be really important. We also know that less than five hours a week of physical activity can increase the risk of injury. And um, obviously there's a bell-shaped curve here that we know if we do too much training, that can also be a risk factor. But I think this became quite evident off the back of COVID where we saw an extended period of not training followed by uh, a spike or an increase then in our training load. And this is something that we've associated with an increased risk of injury, okay? And um, we spoke about strength and conditioning. So what is strength and conditioning? The bottom left here, we have an example of what it doesn't look like. So obviously, too heavy, too young, a um, bit of tongue-in-cheek photo there. And um, moving on though, we have examples of multiple different movements, crawling, jumping, landing, running, moving, lifting, squatting, and um, in an environment that is safe, fun, cohesive, but also challenging. So we have uh, conditions here that make the, the exercise task a little bit more challenging or the constraints a little bit more challenging. And as they progress and get older, then we move up to maybe loading those exercises or those patterns to still continue to increase the challenge or difficulty. Obviously, there are certain concerns 
and or misconceptions around um, strength and conditioning. It's important to note that strength and conditioning isn't just gym-based and strength-based. Speed and agility and muscular endurance can be enhanced by this, although we won't talk too much about these particular components today. And we already mentioned that the improvements we can have in our physical literacy, our skills, balance and flexibility. Um, as mentioned, one of the concerns typically is around it being dangerous, but it's important to know that sport in general is equally, if not more dangerous. Okay, this is an example of such. So we know that sport in itself is inherently dangerous. So the better we can condition and prepare our young athletes for this, the safer they may be when they do take the field. Okay, some other common misconceptions are around stunting growth. This stems from anecdotal data that um, elite weightlifters are small and stocky, therefore weightlifting must stunt their growth. This is akin to saying playing basketball will make me taller because all elite basketballers are tall, therefore playing basketball will help increase my height, which obviously isn't the case. We spoke about the dangers. Uh, other miscon uh, misconceptions can be that it will make you slower, done properly. Proper strength and conditioning should help increase speed rather than slow us down. Building big muscles. Again, this is highly unlikely in, in youth athletes as we don't have the, the hormonal profile that's going to allow for this and typically takes years of training to, to do so. And growth plate injuries. Um, your epithelial growth plate injuries that were once of concern is, has largely been disproven and is more likely to occur in jumping and landing and, and uh, our field sports as opposed to our, our gym-based sports. Okay? There's been a host of research to, to back this up and evidence to back this up that the weight training in youth is safe, that long-term responses to it are positive, and then position statements from the UK and uh, US Strength and Conditioning Association from some of the lead authors in this area, in particular, Rodri Lloyd, Dr. Avery Fagenbaum, John Oliver, um, to name but a few. Okay. So this table here shows the incidence of injury in some youth uh, sports. Okay, so looking at some popular field sports like rugby league, soccer, and GA, and looking at the incidence of injury over 100 hours of match play. What we can see here is that the incidence of injury in these field sports is considerably greater than our weightlifting activity. By weightlifting, we're referring to the sport of Olympic weightlifting. You see two studies here in particular. Boys and girls as young as seven had a zero incidence of injury over one and two years. And this study here where there was one injury happened with uh, a weight plate falling on the foot. So not even the sport itself, but rather from maybe not paying attention um, during the, the down period within the activity. Okay, again, emphasizing the safety of these when done properly. Okay. The injuries in these activities are typically as a result of poor technique, excessive loading, as we've shown in that picture earlier, uh, training while fatigue, perhaps maybe not paying attention then, and a lack of qualified supervision. This is an important point to note that um, we need to make sure that the people who are supervising and running these sessions are qualified. I'm sure there's a host of coaches and parents on the call here who work with, this, with these young age grades and know how difficult it can be to keep them engaged and supervised. And um, so I have a lot of respect for anyone working with these young athletes and young groups, um, but it is important that whoever is leading these strength and conditioning sessions is appropriately qualified, okay? benefits then of strength, uh, strength and conditioning can help increase our strength and power, bone strength and density, balance and coordination, speed and agility, reduce injury risk, enhance our sports performance and our outlook on physical activity. This is particularly important maybe for people who don't play sport and offers another avenue for exercise uh, to encourage and engage with exercise and physical activity without necessarily partaking in a, in a a main sport. Okay, this again is another example of the time loss injuries in an elite soccer academy. This is Arsenal. Uh, prior to 2013, and, and Des Ryan and his team taking over, they had quite a high incidence of injuries. After 2013, when they implemented a world class uh, strength and conditioning program, they significantly reduced the number of injuries over the next couple of seasons. Okay. Obviously, we can't completely eradicate injuries, as we already mentioned. Sport in itself is injurious 
and, and particularly risky, but we can do uh, with good strength and conditioning, we can decrease those numbers. They actually published a paper on this for anyone that is interested, showing their pathway, working with uh, functional competency first and progressing up through different phases, some key considerations throughout developing a, a soccer academy SNC program. Okay. When can we start? How young is too young? This study by Rodri Lloyd and Fagenbaum, who we mentioned earlier, uh, showcased that those who started during pre-adolescence achieved a greater level of motor capacity in adulthood relative to those who started during adolescence, relative to those who only practiced sport, and relative to those who did no sport or conditioning. So again, showcasing the earlier we start, the higher the feeling we can achieve. Okay. Again, this is a youth physical development model from Rodri Lloyd and John Oliver, again, showcasing the subtle differences between male and female, but also emphasizing some key areas. So anything in bold is something that should or could be emphasized during that uh, age grade. So initially we're thinking functional movement or basic functional movement. As we progress on and get older, we're thinking more sport specific skills. Training initially will start with very low or unstructured and fun, progressing into more structure and more uh, high-end control and structure. Okay, and um, it's worth noting that there are some subtle differences here. We know that uh, females mature earlier than boys, uh, and although some boys may not fully mature ever. If anyone is looking to read into this a little bit more, there's an excellent book by the two authors, and then the paper here around that is, is shown here. This is an example of a long-term athletic development model specifically for weightlifting. Okay, so what we see here again, it's quite low structure to start. These are some suggested ages here. They're not necessarily uh, prescriptive. Obviously, anyone who does start, irrespective of what age they start, is going to start in stage one and gradually build up. A 12-year-old, though, may progress a little bit quicker than a six-year-old, for example. Stage one encompasses fundamental moving or weightlifting skills with a focus on physical literacy. As we progress here, again, still staying quite low structured, uh, quite fun, quite engaging, with still a competent or focus on technical competency. And as we progress on, then after a number of years of training, we can still focus on our technical reinforcement whilst adding a little bit more load or more performance-based outcomes and then finally progressing into performance or elite level, whereby we're focusing now more on performance and load. Okay. Again, just to go through these stages in a little bit more detail, stages one and two are gonna be uh, largely based around body weight training and mastering the basic exercises and movement patterns, progressing into maybe some soft resistance, things like med balls, sandbags, and then finally progressing into your barbell training. This is similar for our power progression, important to know that strength underpins power although both are important utilizing some power exercises can help ensure that we get the maximal transfer across from our strength training okay again similarly here we're interested in jumps hops throws and gradually introducing maybe some light resistances before we uh, consider moving on to more weighted or loaded progression okay so when do we progress from body weight to barbell training when we have good control over our own body and limbs good positions and patterns in the six major movements, okay? So for example, six of those movements might look like this. So this is an example from a, a youth scoring table. So when you can achieve 18 points in each of the exercise categories, that's a sign that you've mastered or you're competent with your own body weight and are ready to progress on to loaded variation, okay? So for example, here we get points relative to the number of repetitions we do, points add up over the the different tests and that allows us to achieve our 18 points plus. Again, those scores may be a little bit different for our male youth athlete. Okay, if we wanted to then put that together in more of a, a template for programming, again, in our beginner or young phases, we're starting with fundamental movement, we're starting with body weight, so less intensity and less frequency, maybe one to two sessions a week. As we progress, we might increase the amount of sessions or increase the intensity and um, whilst reducing the the volume okay and that continues to progress on as we get older and more competent speeds increase intensities increase number of sessions may increase and 
the, the rest time will then also have to increase to accommodate that. Okay, so advice in summary for our parents, I would encourage everyone to try and get their children to engage in PE. That way they're gonna see a multitude of different sports uh, and skills to get out and play with their friends as best or as much as possible to incorporate at least one rest day a week where we're completely away from, from structured sports, to try and play different sports in the off season, and um, particularly when the down season is there, that gives us a, an ideal opportunity to, to sample other sports, and um, communicate across sports. So if we are playing a multitude of sports, to make sure that you as the parents are, are communicating that across the coaches. Obviously, our soccer coach won't necessarily know what we did with our GA team. So it is important that someone acts as a go-between to, to liaise across the different sports and coaches. Try and reduce training load during growth spurts. We know if there is a, a heightened or, or a rapid spike in growth, that that can act as a predictor for injury. So it is important during those periods that we reduce the training load, particularly the on-field training load. And that may be an opportunity where we can focus more on the strength and condition and elements that we spoke about trying to introduce resistance training or strength and conditioning under qualified supervision and to make sure that we have fun. Again, the more engaging and enjoyable we can make this, the longer we'll participate and the more, uh, more benefits we'll see long term. Thank you very much for listening. If you'd like to reach out via social media or have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you. Thanks, Tommy. It's a really interesting talk. So we're going to start off with the first question from Peter. At what age would you think elite level young GAA players should be asked to choose between sports? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. Ultimately, it, it's hard to say definitively. Like, you, you need to consider the individual case. How many sports are we talking about? Do the two sports cross over? Are they quite different? Um, in reality, if we're talking about, I think it mentioned Gaelic football there, did it? Um, you're probably thinking after minors, so that kind of under 18 age when you're really starting to get into the the nuts and bolts of, of the sport and you want to start to specialize in order to I suppose advance as much as possible obviously there are outliers and there's people that have gone further than that and gone longer than that but as a general rule of thumb give or take about about 18 years old is when you're going to start to specialize to try and I suppose develop as best as you can in that particular sport and dedicate as much time to it to optimize your performance but also then to um I suppose to ensure that you're not doing too much and too many other bits um but obviously there are outliers along with that as well. Okay, thank you. Um, question from uh, Sergey. Uh, do you have any strength and conditioning plans that you would share with teen for teenagers? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I suppose we, we kind of briefly spoke about that and mentioned some, some ideas in the talk itself. Um, we spoke about the importance of, I suppose, seeking professional guidance. Um, and that's where maybe touching base with a, a local SNC or coming into the clinic is, is going to be beneficial there. Rather than kind of a generic program, you want probably something a little bit more specific and tailored to the, to the individual, to their training needs, to their sport, and then to the injury history if there is one as well. Um, so I, I'd be reluctant to go something too generic, but yeah. at the same time trying to reach out maybe to, to people around you and are coming into the clinic perhaps to, to, to get something put in place. Okay, thank you. Now, there's a question here, and we were just talking about it from TY. He was asking about um, when players are in small to medium schools, and I imagine it means that they're playing a lot of sport in one school and a lot of teams. How can you monitor them to avoid them overtraining and burnout or injury? Yeah, yeah, that, that's a tough one. Like if there's a small club or a small mm. school, I suppose the, the talent pool is inherently going to be smaller. Therefore, the same people have to play for multiple teams, perhaps multiple age grades, multiple sports. That that can be challenging. I suppose the most important thing is is the player and I suppose the parent and coach's relationship and, and trying to make those communica communication channels as, as, as open as possible so that there is a link between between everyone and, and monitoring that. Um so I would say first and foremost, communication is the most important thing. And then just I suppose, asking the athlete, how do you feel? Um, during, during periods of, of a growth spurt, that's when you might kind of try and reel in the, the training a little bit and reduce the training load a little bit. Maybe that's where you could focus a little bit more on, on strength and conditioning activities or, or, or not as much heavy load on the pitch. Um, there are other things you can do in terms of, I suppose, monitoring training in terms of maybe the minutes on the pitch or how much training hours you're doing a week as a, as a slightly easier tool to monitor um, and just making sure that that's not peaking or spiking in certain points of the year and stays a little bit more consistent, but also then 
uh, having periods within the year and within the week, within the month even, where there's going to be slightly lower periods as well to, to facilitate rest. Okay, thank you. Um, question here uh, from Petra. Now, this is more of a general question about how much pain should be tolerated after running? Normally, it gets better after two to three weeks of doing moderate exercise. Is it better to continue running or is it better to do light exercise and then try and go running again after two to three weeks? Yeah, well, well I suppose first and foremost, you, you have to consider why is your knee sore? Yeah. Um, I, ideally, you're not ever really exercising and or running through pain. Mm. Um, pain can act as an, an inhibitor. It can, you know, lead to obviously more pain or, or, or perhaps worsening of the, of the injury or the underlying injury. So ideally trying to get to the bottom of why the knee is sore and then rehab that and get back to running pain free. So I'd be reluctant to encourage anyone to run through pain um, at, a, at any kind of age or level really. And yeah. um, so try, try and get to the underlying cause see a physio or, or, or someone and, and try and get on top of it that way. If you can find other modes of exercise in that period that are pain-free and uh, maybe less loading or less weight-bearing activities, absolutely work away with them. But I would still advise to try and get to the underlying cause of it and, and, you know, and rehab that and get it better before really pushing on the exercise or, or, or training through pain. Yeah, thanks, Tori. Uh, this is the last question now from uh, Paul Wallace. He's, um, how can a 17-year-old plan the post-surgery for a ruptured ACL operation due at this month. What strength and conditioning could be done during rehab? Okay, sorry, say that one again. So you say it's a 17 year old, he's, he's having an ACL, he's got a ruptured ACL. And I think okay. they're asking what strength and conditioning should they be planning to do afterwards? But I'd imagine that as well be under the consultant as well. Yeah, yeah. So the, the consultant is going to have some some clear guidelines. I guess it depends on that what stage you're at. You know, further down the track, you're going to be able to do a lot more. In the early, early stages post-op, you're probably not going to be doing as much. But uh, depending on where they're taking the graft from, whether it's the patella tendon graft or a hamstring graft, that's also going to influence it. But in reality, we want to try and keep the knee as calm and happy as possible. Um, so not doing any activities that aggravate the knee and then trying to build up strength um, in the localized area, the quad, the hamstring, the glutes. Again, that might be a bit more dependent on the graft type. Um, but trying to build them up in, in pain-free movement. Initially, that might be a little bit more isolated uh, leg raises, et cetera. And then that progresses into more your, your generic kind of strength activities like your squats, your single leg squats, et cetera. <clears throat> he said he's post-op though, didn't he? He's, no, he's, I think he's having surgery in two weeks' time. So he was okay, just, okay, yeah. yeah. So, so pre-op, I suppose the goal is to, again, go in with the knee happy. So there's, you know, it's minimal effusion or, or swelling in the knee, full range of motion. Do what bits of strength training you can, provided depending on the toler the, how tolerable the knee is to it. Typically, at this point, if he's, if he's two weeks pre-op, uh, usually the knee is in a pretty good place and you can actually do quite a bit of loading on it. And um, then post-op, obviously that's going to reduce again because there's going to be some swelling and inflammation and stuff. And um, so usually the two weeks post, you can do a good bit of work. The key thing is again, not to aggravate the knee in the process. So try and build strength as best you can. Again, specifically around the kind of quad is going to be the big one there um, without annoying the knee in the process being a, a key factor there as well. Lovely. Tommy, thanks very much for joining us tonight. So uh, 